My name is Hannah Cottle. I grew up in uh, mostly Blackie, Kentucky. So I think your upbringing has a lot to do with, you know, your mindset and your mental state and how you view things. Um, and especially the case with me because when my parents divorced, I was four years old, and automatically as like a really young child, even not really understanding what divorce meant, I knew that my parents were not living in the same place. And this is a small town, so pretty much everyone knows everything that happens with other people. You know, stuff kind of gets out. Um, and until I was like 12, 11 or 12, it was a lot of custody battles between my mom and my dad. And so that I was always struggling, do I have to choose a parent? Do I have, you know, what am I supposed to do? And now I'm pretty familiar with the courthouse here because I've been in it so many times. And I think one of the hardest things was it was constantly going to court and then fighting. And I think one thing that really affected me, especially with my self-esteem, guilt and anxiety, was I felt that I was never making the right choice. When I said I want to live with my mom, I felt like I'm doing something wrong. And that's been the case like ever since then is I'll make a choice and then I'll think I'm just doing the wrong thing. I, I'm, I've always wanted to please everybody like I did when I was younger. One of the biggest things that was a main thing throughout my whole childhood and my whole upbringing, whether I was with my dad's side of the family, whether I was with my mom's side of the family, was that there, there was always some kind of fighting, not physical violence or not, you know, actually fighting. It was always words and people being hurtful and people arguing. And I always felt like a doll that my parents were fighting over. That made me feel like, I guess I'm not as important because if I was, then they would see, hey, we need to, you know, we need to get it together for our child. I felt like no matter what I said, that was always held against me. And it was either I'm not being heard and no one really cares what I had to say. And then on the other end, it was, oh, well, they're hearing me. They just don't really care what I'm saying. More than anything, probably carried over to a lot of the things that affect me today was that feeling of voicelessness. My mom moved. I moved with her when she married my stepdad. At the beginning of sixth grade, I left Cowan because my, me and my mom had been living with my stepdad and he abused me and that came out and when that came out, that's when I had to move. And that's what really kickstarted my anxiety it was the feeling of fear that's gonna happen again, and paranoia. I started having flashbacks when I started being paranoid, when I would be laying in bed and it was as clear as day like I could hear the voice of the person that abused me. If, if it felt, when it felt like they were in the room, when they clearly weren't, that was terrifying because I didn't know what was causing that. I didn't have a name to it. I felt paranoia, but I didn't know what it was called. I didn't know what paranoia was. I had flashbacks, but I didn't know what a flashback was. In seventh grade, that was the first time that I truly thought about killing myself. And now when I look back, I think, I kind of wonder where I got that idea from because, you know, I was a seventh grader and that really shows you that mental health does not discriminate. It doesn't care if you're 10, it doesn't care if you're five, it doesn't care if you're an old woman or a man, you know, it doesn't care if you're middle aged, it doesn't care if you're white, it doesn't care if you're a male, it doesn't care if you're a female. And I think a lot of people forget about that. They think, oh, it's, it's only adults. They don't want to think that it's their children 
the young people in their life that they know because how could they understand what depression is? During middle school is when a lot of my mental health issues started, when the depression started, when the anxiety started. I think it was that I first said to myself, I wanna die. And so I went to a place called Rivendell down in Bowling Green in Kentucky. And I stayed there maybe a week. Even though I didn't really understand what was going on in my own head, you know, I could, you can have a psychiatrist talk to you for three hours, or you can talk to them and say every single thing that's happened in your life, but it's still hard to grasp what's going on in your mind because it, it is so complicated and it goes so deep and it's so much more than just feeling sad or just feeling nervous sometimes. Around that time is also when I started self-harming. I think that especially in today's culture, no one, people don't really understand. And I think that is a cause of a lot of problems. And I'm not saying that you not understanding depression makes someone depressed, you know, but it is frustrating when you're struggling with something and it feels like no one understands what you're going through and no one could even begin to understand what you're going through. So after the first time I went down to Rivendell, I came back, pretty much things were the same at home. And then I was also dealing with the abuse that I suffered. There was a, a trial coming up and that terrified me. That was the root of so many of my problems not just the trauma alone, but the fact that I have to talk about this again. I have to relive it again. I have to see this person. I have to face this person. What if no one believes me? Then this is all gonna be for nothing. And it was my mind, it, 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 it kind of felt like my mind was trying to destroy itself. Like there were so many things going on. And it was kind of like I was turning against myself. The trial actually happened, so that gave me a little bit of closure and that made me kind of feel like, okay, things are going to start to get a little bit better. But you can be so far away from the trauma. The trauma can be all the way in the past and it still seems like it's right there with you sometimes. And that's when I really started to feel the stigma that's attached to these kind of things. I think for some people it's hard for them to connect that to the person and see this is real. And it's not just having one bad day, it's not just being sad. When I was told by a doctor, I, I feel like you have post-traumatic stress. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people get confused. Oh, you have PTSD? Well, you must have been in a war, you must have been in the military. And that is really common. But I think some people also forget you could be a seven-year-old to have PTSD. When I started taking medicine, I've been on so many, honestly, can't name off all of them. But I started taking medicine and of course, when someone goes to the doctor and they have a cold and you get prescribed an antibiotic, that's normal. Or if you have a heart problem, or if you have a lot of headaches and you take Tylenol, or if you have a stomach problem and you take stomach medicine, that's completely normal to people. Once you attach the mind to it, then people start to kind of get, well, I don't know about that. As a sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth grader, I didn't understand that. And I just automatically assumed that that was wrong. And that's when I really started to develop the idea of, I want to be normal. I didn't want to know what anxiety was. I didn't want to know what depression was. And I thought that was normal. And it took me years to realize that there is no normal.
so when I started high school, I joined JROTC, uh, which is Junior Officer Reserve Training Corps. It, to describe it in one sentence is it teaches you leadership. That's the main thing. It teaches you skills. It teaches you to be more confident. It gets you out of your shell, and that's especially what it did for me. That first year, my freshman year, I would have panic attacks during practice. And I'd be gone for 20 minutes just trying to recover from my panic attacks. And having that family and just being supported by so many other people and being pushed out of my comfort zones and having to do a little bit of public speaking and doing things in front of the community and performing in front of a bunch of people. That gave me a little bit more confidence. I could recognize some of my own strengths. The first time that I actually put action to feeling suicidal, when I actually attempted it, was September of 2015. It was actually the day of the Mountain Heritage Parade. I was in JRTC, so I was there participating in it. I was with my friend all morning, and at the time, I just wasn't doing good emotionally or mentally. I just wasn't in a good place. I was so frustrated, feeling this, you know, feeling this sadness and feeling this hopelessness and desperation and all these mixtures of emotion. I didn't know how to deal with it. And that morning, on the way there, I had a terrible argument with my dad. And that was just kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back. I got home. You know, by this point, over the years, I'd considered doing this many times and I had a bottle of migraine pills. I don't know how many were in the bottle. It was probably about all the way full. And when I took them, that little part of me I didn't want to die was screaming, tell somebody, tell somebody. You, you can't let this happen. So I don't remember which I did first. I messaged my friend, two of my friends. And I told them. They, they knew what was going on because they knew what happened that morning and I had told them, I'm gonna kill myself when I get home. Like, I don't wanna be alive anymore. And I know I called my mom and I said, Mom, I took some pills. She asked me how many, I told her. So she was immediately like, go tell your dad. I didn't wanna tell him because we'd argued that day and then I thought he's going to be angry at me. He's going to be angry because I didn't tell him. You know, he's going to be scared. So I walked in there and I gave it to him. I don't remember much of what he said, you know. I was conscious. I was okay at that point, you know. I wasn't passed out or anything. I wasn't throwing up. And then we drove to the hospital. I told him. and actually saying it to them, you know, going to the hospital and actually talking to someone I didn't know and saying, I wanted to end my life, so I took some migraine pills. Immediately in my head, I was like, they're gonna think I'm crazy. That's the word that kept going in my head was crazy. They're gonna think I'm crazy. They're gonna think I'm some crazy kid. They're gonna think I'm insane. My mom was there. Of course, my mom was crying. I was crying. My dad wasn't in the room. And that's when it hit me. I think that was the most impactful experience of my life because then that's when I really realized 
I could have done one thing different and I could have died. I could have just stayed in my room and no one would have known and then they would have just found me. And that's when I really understood it. And I wanted, I wanted to get help. I didn't know how exactly I was gonna get through it, but I knew I needed it. My sophomore year in JRTC, uh, I became the CSN, Command Sergeant Major, which meant I was over about 40 cadets. And that was the first leadership role that I really had in my life. I was over all the enlisted people in our battalion. I don't know how many, roughly 40, I would say. And that really, it didn't just push me out of my comfort zone. It picked me up and threw me out of my comfort zone. But that helped me so much with my anxiety and my feeling of self-worth because suddenly I wasn't just responsible for myself. I was responsible for all these other people. I wanted to be in a good place for me, but I also did for other people because I didn't want to let them down. And that's also when I got into running and working out. And that, that was my escape. When I ran, I wasn't thinking about what was going on at home. It was just me. My depression didn't have power over me. Even though my parents did fight a lot, they supported me when I would see my therapist. They took me to see my psychiatrist. They got me help, and I had access to that help. The pain, it can't control you. You just have to recognize them, and you have to make the conscious decision to say, that's not who I am. This does not define me. The only thing that I hold true is the memories of me and you as kids dancing happily in the rain. It's an Appalachian lullaby sang nightly by a gleaming sky that song always holds a perfect tune. Amazing touch you say It's a cultural